hello there. My name is Andy Warner. I'm the minister at Barrel Presbyterian Church and I'd like to welcome each and every one of you to our time of worship together here in this online church service. It's not our ideal way of worshipping together and we are really looking forward to being able to gather again as God's people in one place. But for the moment we can worship in this way, knowing that the kind of worshippers God seeks are those who worship in spirit and truth. And we can do that, even with an online service. We can praise Him, even in song, with the songs on our playlist, or in the service that you're watching now. We can pray to Him together, as we will also do in this service, and in our kids' time. His word will be heard as it is read to us, and we'll explore it together. All those things are worship. And when we do that in a loving response to God for what he has done for us in Jesus, well, we worship together in spirit, hearing his truth. If you are visiting or would like to reach out to us, even just to say hi, we'd love to hear from you. So why not drop us a note on the email address that's been showing on your screen? That is ministerbpc at gmail.com or send a message through our Facebook page. Just look for Barrel Presbyterian Church. You'll also find a link there early each Sunday for our church services so you'll always be able to find us. Today you get another break from me. <laughs> Phew, I'm sure some of you are saying. In fact over the next two weeks we're going to hear from a friend of mine, Matt Crocker. We'll hear from a short so uh, series he did recently from Romans, specifically Romans chapter 8. Now some of you might be thinking, haven't we just done a series on Romans? I know I thought that, but in fact that was nearly two years ago. Time flies. I'll introduce you to Matt a little later and hear why Romans 8 came to mind when a little virus started changing the world we live in. What we will hear from Matt serves as a reminder of who we are when the things of this world seem out of control. In another letter that Paul wrote, uh, this time to the church in Philippi, he gave us words that we can cling to in troubles, but they're also great words as a framework for us, a refrain to echo in our minds as we come to worship. And they're from Philippians chapter 3, verse 20. But our citizenship is in heaven, and we eagerly await a saviour from there, the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, hi kids. Today we have a really special treat for our kids' talk. We're going to see an interview with the Apostle Paul. Well, of course, it's not the real Apostle Paul. He's now in heaven with Jesus. We are going to watch an actor pretend to be Paul. But this actor has something very important to teach us about God and how God changes us when we believe and follow Jesus. <laughs> Hello and welcome to Life with Bubbles, the talk show where we discuss life with, with, with me, Bubbles. <laughs> Today, we are meeting someone whose life was changed when he discovered the hard way that the mission of the risen King Jesus cannot be stopped. Please 
Put your hands together for Paul! Oh, welcome, Paul! <sighs> Thanks very much, Bubbles. Thanks for having me. Well, now, just before we get started, mm -hmm. is it Paul or is it Saul? Well, I used to be called Saul, but since the change, um, I tend ah. to be called Paul. Ah, okay, but the change is, is actually what we're going to be talking about today. To yep. start, tell us about your childhood. Well, I was born into a very religious household. Uh, oh, yes, you were so cute. Oh. <laughs> uh, well, well, thank you. And, uh, and my mum and dad, they did what all good parents should do, and they taught me all about the one true God. Uh, I believe you even went to a special religious school in Jerusalem. That's right. Uh, I was taught all about God's law and how to live a life that pleases God. Ah, oh, and, and when you finished school... Yes, uh, that's when I became a Pharisee. A, a Pharisee? Yes, uh, yes. Uh, we were religious leaders, and we were really, really good at being good oh. <laughs> and, and making sure that everyone else was being good too. Oh, okay, and, and during that time, yep. you came across people who, who were on Jesus' mission. They mm. were telling people that Jesus was the king, and they were saying that people had to accept Jesus as their king. Mm. Well, how did that make you feel? feel to say that i hated it would be an understatement mm -hmm. uh, i knew god's word really really well and so i knew all about god's promise to send a king who would rescue his people and i was really really looking forward to god fulfilling that promise oh, yeah yeah so i was horrified <gasps> when i heard that there were people saying that jesus was that king whoa well why did this horrify you well, because Jesus had been killed on a cross, on a tree. I thought there is no way that Jesus could be God's true king. So I made it my mission to stop Jesus' mission. Oh, well, when you say you made it your mission to stop Jesus' mission, hmm. what, what did that look like? It meant that I arrested many of Jesus' followers and put them in jail. And I also approved as some of them were killed. Oh, well, but, but it didn't work? <laughs> no, no, the message just kept on spreading. Oh, well, that must have made you very mad. I was yeah. furious. Well, I thought yeah. I need to do something about this. And I'd heard that the message had spread as far away as Damascus. Oh. That was a long way from Jerusalem. And so I thought I need to go to Damascus and arrest uh, whatever Jesus followers that I can find there. Oh, but, uh, but it was on this journey that the change happened, right? <laughs> That's right, Bubbles. Yeah. Uh, I was on my way to, to Damascus. I was riding my horse. <laughs> and then suddenly there was this bright light. It just appeared in front of me. Whoa, wow. Yeah, yeah. And I just, I fell to the ground. <laughs> I covered my burning eyes. And then I heard this voice. A voice? And the voice was saying things to me, and it was, it was cutting straight to my heart. The voice said, Saul, Saul, why are you attacking me? Whoa, why are you attacking me? Well, who was it? Well, I didn't know. All I could say was, no, who are you, Lord? And the voice said, I am Jesus, <gasps> who you are attacking. Oh, oh, oh how did you feel? How did I feel? Yeah. I was shocked. I was terrified. This was Jesus. I thought Jesus was dead and Jesus was alive. Jesus is God's true king. Jesus is the king that God had sent to rescue his people. And I'd been working against him. <gasps> yeah. I thought I was doomed. Oh, no. Oh, but, but you weren't? No. No. Instead, my life was changed forever. <gasps> when you say changed forever instead of striking me down mm -hmm. jesus told me that i was to join his mission <gasps> and jesus Whoa. mission is that people from all around the world mm -hmm. would hear that jesus is the king and that people from all around the world would accept jesus as their king wow that is a change indeed it is and Whoa. jesus is the risen king and Whoa. jesus will accept and forgive anyone oh. who repents and turns to him and Jesus will send them on his mission because oh. the mission of the risen King Jesus cannot be 
stopped. Oh, <laughs> wow. Well, thank you very much, Paul, for coming in and sharing with us your wonderful story. Thanks so oh. much, Bubbles. It's been great to be here. Well, isn't that amazing? God completely changed Paul. You might think, well, that can only happen to some special people. But whoever believes in Jesus and follows him will be changed. They'll be a changed person, no matter how old or young you are. So how will we change? Well, we will trust Jesus and know that he is in control, even while we have this problem with the coronavirus. We can trust Jesus no matter how bad things seem. And when we trust Jesus, well, we don't have to be afraid of what is happening with the virus. But, I mean, we'll still need to be sensible to protect us and other people. You know, to make sure we follow all the instructions about washing our hands often, keeping our distance from people when we are out, like at the shops, and not going out when we're sick. But Jesus doesn't want just us to trust him in him. In our world, many more people need to hear about Jesus so that they can also believe in him and trust him. So what should we do? Well, apart from making sure we wash our hands and doing all the other things we are told to do, well, we can tell people about Jesus. And what is the best way to know what to tell people about Jesus? Well, if we read our Bibles every day, then we will learn more about him and we'll be able to tell others what we learn. And we can pray and ask Jesus to help us tell others the truth about him. So let's talk to God about that now. Why not close your eyes with me so that we can concentrate better? Let's pray. Dear God, thank you that no matter what happens in our world, you are still in control. Please help us to trust Jesus more each day. Please help us to read our Bibles each day so that we can learn more about you. And please help us to tell other people about Jesus. Amen. Announcements. Now, I'm sure most of us have been keeping an eye on events recently in Victoria and even close to home, where the virus has re-emerged. If nothing else, it tells us that this virus is still around and we have a way to go. Our New South Wales government has hinted that before long, masks may be required wearing. One of our church family wants us to stay ahead of the game and has generously been working towards having masks made for every member of our church family and wants you to have one. They will be ready soon, so stay tuned and I'll let you know uh, about that and how you can get yours. Also, just a quick reminder that we have our Zoom morning tea happening at 11.15am. So please join us. Join in for a time of fellowship and to encourage others, as well as yourself. Also, Bible studies uh, on Tuesday nights or Wednesday afternoons are also available to everyone on, we, we do that also via Zoom. It's a great way to study God's Word, we do it together, but you don't even have to leave home. As I mentioned earlier, uh, we're going to hear a message today from a friend of mine, Matt Crocker. I spoke to Matt earlier this week to allow uh, the opportunity for him to introduce himself to you. So here's a bit of that interview now. Well, I'd like to introduce Matt Crocker to you. Now, just to give you a bit of background, uh, Matt and I have known each other, I reckon, about 15 years. Now, Matt, right? Matt might be a bit surprised about, about that. Uh, I was when I thought back on it. Yeah. Because uh, even though we've known each other that long, um, we met through uh, going to the same church, Gosford Presbyterian Church, starting off in particular at Night Church, um, where Kerry and I um, were attending church at that stage, but we moved into the morning service, so we saw less of Matt, and then Matt moved to Sydney for some study at one stage, and now he's up north of um, the Central Coast. He's up in the Newcastle region um, at Walls End Presbyterian Church. He's also involved with Grace. Um, so uh, that's 
kind of a little bit of a background. So I was just going to ask Matt if he wouldn't mind uh, telling us a little bit about himself, about his family, and about his church life. Okay. Um, yeah, I'm, uh, I grew up in a Christian family. Um, I grew up going to Gosford Presbyterian Church, so that's my home church. Uh, went there for, from when I was about five years old to when I was about 25. Um, when I went off to Bible college um, to train for ministry. Um, yeah, so I'm married to Mel. Um, we got married just before we started Bible college. Um, we've now got three kids. We've got Naomi, who is seven. We've got Samuel, who is just turning five on Saturday, actually. And uh, Daniel, he's just been born. He is about eight weeks old, maybe. Yeah, eight weeks old, ten weeks old, something like that. So he was born in the middle of the coronavirus. That was an interesting time. But, yeah, that's, that's my family. We're up here in Wall's End um, doing church revitalization work. Um, we've been doing been up here for about eight years, or seven and a half years now. Um, yeah. Yeah. Uh, one of the other things is uh, that Matt and I do get to, a chance to catch up and get to know each other a bit better because we're part of a, uh, a minister's retreat group that um, has been meeting. So um, yeah, we've been able to share some stories and, and stuff as well. So that's been good. So, so far, uh, how have things affected you with this uh, COVID-19 pandemic? Uh, how have you responded and what's been going on for you? Well, when the first when it started hitting, I thought, great, we're going, I'm going to get a few weeks of, of, of you know working from home. I thought it'd be it'd be lovely, but it was months of just crazy busyness. We we moved to doing church online. We we collaborated with a church that we're to, we are um, part of the same pastoral charge, um, Grace. So we had online services, which were quite a big production to put together. So we had to we were basically um, we realised we we're basically running a TV show every week. So that was a fair bit of work, but um, it was rewarding and it was nice to get out of the house once a week. Um, yeah, we did Zoom morning teas and Zoom Bible study groups and all that kind of stuff like you guys are doing. Um, so that was, a yeah, it was just a lot of uncertainty. You know, having the kids home, doing homeschool was pretty tricky because my wife was just about ready to give birth the whole way through that. In fact, she was doing homeschool with our kids the day she went into, like, went while she was in labour. Uh, well, I was frantically trying to get stuff finished off for work so I could have two weeks off on maternity leave. So that was your initial, that was how things um, worked initially. What What's happening now? So I'm glad lockdown finished when it did because I'm an extrovert and I just about run out of batteries. So it's been nice being able to be back together with people again. <laughs> um, so we, we've started, so our church um, has got, we, we kind of got people kind of at both ends of the spectrum without a lot of people in the middle. So we've got quite a, we've got a few, quite a few older people and a lot of younger people and there's kind of no one in the middle, which is kind of weird. Um, but that's just the way it is. So we've ended up um, meeting into, as two separate groups. The, the older, more vulnerable people are meeting on Thursdays um, and having a service with them. And then the younger people with all the kids are meeting on Sunday mornings because um, we've got quite a small building, so that means that everyone we kind of we can only have twenty five in the building at once. So that, that's kind of working. Um, yeah, we've got we've set up cafe tables and a coffee machine. Andy knows that anything I do is going to have coffee involved somehow. Um, yeah, so that that's kind of working well. Um, it's kind of cool in some ways. We're having about equal number of kids as adults, which has made from trash be pretty noisy. Um, but um, but yeah, it's it's working fairly well. Um, I would much prefer to have everyone back together again. But and we've been um, very fortunate in that you've um, made available to us uh, a series that you started out when things um, we first went into this pandemic. Um, you uh, preached a series um, in Romans, uh, Romans eight specifically and we're going to look at a couple of those um, in the next few weeks so thank you for that firstly but I just want to ask you um, why did you go what was the reason you went to Romans 8 uh, when uh, you were looking to um, speak to people about what's going on and, and what's what it may be what we think God is doing in all of this um 
Yeah, the, uh, there's another kind of more personal reason why I went to Romans 8. Um, while I was at Bible college, I lived quite close to my grandparents. And I actually would go and read the Bible with my, my grandmother. Lost the ability to be able to read, but she could still hear. Um, and I used to go and read the Bible to her um, every couple of weeks. Um, and one particular week, I read Romans 8 to her in the nursing home. And she just grabbed my hand and looked at me straight in the eye and said, that is my favorite passage in the whole Bible. And I could see that because in her Bible, it had been underlined and highlighted so many times. Yeah. Um, and sadly, she died about three days later. All Suddenly, right. she just had a heart attack and died. Um, and so it was pretty obvious to me what I had to preach on at her funeral. Yeah. Um, and yeah, so ever since then, Romans 8's had a really special place in my heart. And it helped me kind of process my grandmother dying yeah. um, because that's what it's all about. Yeah. Um, like understanding how suffering and death fits into the world. Um, yeah, so so really when the, when the pandemic hit, it was a no brainer it was where I first went in for my own, my own heart. And then I thought, well, if I'm going there for me, I, I think it'd be a helpful thing for our people as well. So. Well, we're very grateful to you to uh, share this with us. And we're looking forward to getting into uh, God's word and having you open it for us and, and share it with us. So thanks very much, Matt. And um, we'll be praying for you guys up at, uh, World's End at Grace, and I know that uh, Clarence Town, where my brother Phil goes, he preached last week, and Dungog have been involved in the early part of uh, your services, online services as well. So thanks for that. We appreciate it. And all the best to you.
When Paul wrote to the church in Ephesus, he encouraged them to always be praying with these words that we read in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 18. And pray in the Spirit on all occasions and with all kinds of prayers and requests. With this in mind, be alert and always keep on praying for all the Lord's people. An online church, worshipping together, is certainly an occasion for prayer. So please join with me as we pray now to our great God. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, our great God, when we come to you in prayer as we do now, knowing who you are as sovereign king and what you have done for us in Jesus, it is like walking out of darkness and into the light just as it should be. As the Apostle John said of Jesus, he is the true light who came into the world. So when you draw us to him and make it possible for us to know him, we are drawn to his light and our eyes are opened to your grace to us. Our prayer is that we live in and through your grace, honouring Jesus as our Lord and Saviour in all we do and say and how we act towards each other and to neighbours, friends and family who need to know your saving grace. We acknowledge, Lord, we come to you with our emptiness, our times of defeat, our excuses ready to cast blame to anyone or anywhere other than ourselves in our lack of praise, gratitude and service to our King. But we are grateful that in and through Jesus that we are not only forgiven but in him all things, including ourselves, are made new. We can rely and trust in your promises that despite our failures, despite our self-centeredness, that we appear to you cloaked in Jesus' righteousness. Not by what we have achieved or even try to achieve, but by believing, trusting and giving our hearts to Jesus. We are enabled to claim his perfect merit and call ourselves your children. Thank you, Father. Lord, we do come humbly to you with requests, anxieties and petitions, knowing you will hear us. And we can be confident in coming to you because Jesus stands at your right hand to intercede with the words we bring and that your Holy Spirit carries from our hearts, our hearts that you know even better than we do. So Lord, hear our prayer. As we live in this world that we see cannot be controlled, by the human heart or endeavours, but only by your sovereignty. We ask for your mercy on a world that is hurting with the current pandemic. We know, Lord, that there are many people sick, hurting through loss and with a hopeless outlook because leaders are either not caring for their people or are simply unable to. So, Lord, for those who are suffering, for those who need your protection and those who need your mercy, please intervene and bring about a quick solution and healing to this sorry world. We include our own country, state and region in these prayers and uphold our leaders to you, asking that you give them strength, resilience and wisdom as they look to care for our people, even with what might seem harsh measures. At the same time, we give thanks that we do have leaders in this country who have stepped up and taking measures to not only protect people from the virus, but doing what they can within the country's means to protect people's livelihoods, jobs and families. We pray for our leaders and in particular our Prime Minister Scott Morrison. Please strengthen not only his resolve, his faith in you, and through this he will go closer to you and as a witness to your truths. Lord, we pray for Australian Presbyterian World Mission, who we have heard from in recent weeks. We thank you that even under these difficult pandemic conditions, their work continues. We give thanks that they were able to raise such significant funds towards the Cyclone Damage Tulua Ministry Centre in Vanuatu. We pray for both Kevin Murray and Cheryl Sarkozy in their work for APWM as they continue to make us aware of the needs of those who step out into the world to show and speak of God's saving love. Our prayer also, Lord, is to uphold, bless and strengthen the work of organisations such as Open Doors, 
an organisation that not only looks to support Christians in places that do not share the same freedoms to follow Jesus as we enjoy, but encourages us to pray for our brothers and sisters and informs us of prayer needs, such as those Christians in Burkina Faso, a country of 20 million who live under Islamic oppression rather than the religious tolerant leadership it once enjoyed. This country has seen a dramatic escalation in persecution over the last year. Uh, so Lord, we do pray for those more than 15,000 Christians who are now displaced and fear for their very survival. Please strengthen their faith in the face of extreme pressure that they now come under to renounce this faith in Jesus. Lord, let them know your presence and undying love for them. And Lord, we do pray for our church as we continue through this time of uncertainty, having not been able to meet. We also pray for your hand and spirit to work within us, to strengthen our resolve, to grow in our faith, to hunger for your word and respond to your grace in praise and witness to you, to love those who rebel against you, and to love and care for our brothers and sisters in Christ. To uphold in prayer those hurting or healing, Lillian and Peter, David and Evelyn, John and Norma, Lawrence and Sue. We thank you that one day we will all rejoice in the glory that will be ours with no more hurts, pains or grief when we are in the presence of Jesus. And it's in his name we pray. Amen. Have you got your Bibles with you? Uh, if you haven't, why not hit pause now and go and grab it along with a pen and a notepad. I'll always encourage you to be writing down any thoughts, maybe even highlighting verses in your Bible that stand out to you. And then make a note about why a verse or verses made an impression on you and so you can then come back to it. Because if you're like me, you might have a thought, and if you don't write it down, by the end of the talk, it's all gone. So if you have to hit pause to go and grab those things, please do, please do so now. Today, our reading will be from Romans chapter 8, verses 1 to 11. Joan Powell is going to bring us our reading now, and then we will hear from Matt Crocker. Thanks, Joan. Reading from Romans, chapter 8, verses 1 to 11. Therefore, there is now no condemnation of those who are in Jesus Christ, because through Christ Jesus, the law of the Spirit of life set me free from the law of sin and death. For what the law was powerless to do in that it was weakened by the sinful nature, God did by sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful man to be a sin offering. And so he condemned sin in sinful man, in order that the righteous requirements of the law might be fully met in us, who, who do not live according to the sinful nature, but according to the spirit. Those who live according to the sinful nature have their minds set on what their nature desires. But those who live in accordance with the spirit have their minds set on what the spirit desires. The mind of sinful man is death, but the mind controlled by the spirit is life and peace. The sinful mind is hostile to God. It does not submit to God's law, nor can it do so. Those controlled by the sinful nature cannot please God. You, however, have con are controlled not by the sinful nature, but by the spirit, if the spirit of God lives in you. 
And if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, he does not belong to Christ. But if Christ is in you, your body is dead because of sin, yet your spirit is alive because of righteousness. And if the Spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead is living in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his Spirit who lives in you. This is the word of the Lord. Given the enormity of what is happening in our world, we decided as a leadership team that it was appropriate for us to pause our normal Bible teaching series in Hebrew and Mark's Gospel to spend some time addressing the crisis we face as a church, as a nation and as a planet. We're going to begin our series by spending four weeks in Romans 8. Now Romans 8 is an amazing chapter of the Bible. We would all probably feel better if we read Romans 8 every day during this crisis. This amazing chapter lays out the personal and cosmic implications of the gospel and shows how we as Christians can have great certainty in an uncertain world, how we can have great hope in a world that often seems hopeless, how we can trust God in the midst of our greatest doubts. The Apostle Paul in this chapter is a realist about the state of the world, how there is suffering and misery and death. In Romans 8, Paul reflects on the world, how it isn't the way God created it to be. Now, this chapter is special to me. When terrible things happen in my life, this is a chapter I turn to. When I'm angry at God, this is one of the places I go to. And my prayer for all of us as we spend the next few weeks digging into, into this amazing chapter of God's Word is that we will see our salvation afresh, that we will be moved to thankfulness, and that we will grow in our certainty as we live for Jesus in a difficult and uncertain world, a world of pain and sorrow, a world which Paul, is, which Paul says is groaning, but a world which God promises to put right. So let's pray, asking God to help us understand this amazing part of his word. Faithful God, many of us are scared. We've had our supports taken away from us. We feel adrift in a, a sea of chaos, at the mercy of a microscopic enemy. We pray, Father, that you might use this passage to remind us that you are our sovereign God, that you love us, and that you are sure that you are a sure and strong anchor in this stormy world. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Who you are changes how you respond. A few months after we moved to Newcastle, my sister and brother-in-law were visiting us to meet our daughter Naomi when she was just a little baby. While we were catching up, we heard someone driving very fast around where we live in Cameron Park, skidding around the corners and braking loudly. Now, my brother-in-law, who is a policeman, said to me, I hope this guy doesn't have an accident or I'm going to have to go and help him while I'm on holidays. Anyway, just a less than a minute after he said that, we heard a huge crash. So he, he went towards the noise to see if he could help, thinking it was some young hoons that got themselves into trouble. You know, I, I went as well, you know, for backup. When we got there, we saw the car crash with the door open and lots of people standing around. One lady pointed to some bush nearby and said, he's in there. Now my brother-in-law, wearing a t-shirt, shorts and thongs, ran into the bush. I figured I should leave hunting the bad guys to him and I stayed on the road. Anyway, he found the guy hiding under some leaves and, and he brought him up to the road. By this stage, we were hearing sirens everywhere. A police car went past and I flagged them down. That was my contribution to the, to the event. And my brother-in-law told the policeman that he was a cop and that this was the bad guy. And I've never seen someone move so fast. The cop had the guy on the ground and in handcuffs in about five seconds flat. It turns out this guy wasn't a young hoon, but rather a dangerous, wanted criminal. You see, who you are changes how you respond. I'm just an ordinary pastor. I don't chase bad guys into the bush. 
But my brother-in-law is a six foot tall copper. He does chase bad guys into the bush. Who you are changes how you respond. Romans 8 starts by telling us who we are as Christians. Have a look at it with me. Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Can you see very clearly who we are? If you are a Christian, then you are in Christ Jesus. This little phrase, in Christ Jesus, is a theologically very significant phrase. What Paul means when he says, in Christ Jesus, he's actually referring to something earlier, which he's written in chapter 6, verse 1 to 11, where he says, if you've become a Christian... If you have accepted Jesus as your Lord and Saviour, then you have been united with him in death. Jesus' death 2,000 years ago was your death and his resurrection, your resurrection. So friends, we are in him. And we see that being in Christ Jesus brings with it an amazing change in our circumstances. We see from first verse 1 that our identity of being in Christ Jesus changes our status before a holy God you see our identity before God used to be one of condemnation we were enemies with God rebels to him this in fact has been one of the main messages of Paul's letter to the church in Rome now right from chapter 1 Paul has outlined just how bad we are as human beings And this is where biblical Christianity is at odds with our modern culture. Modern society believes that every human being is born good and learns to be bad. It's the job of the education and social services and the police, etc. to prevent human beings naturally bad or to try to make them better if they are. The problem with this idea of human beings naturally good or even neutral is that it just doesn't square with reality. As we've already seen through this crisis, at the first signs of trouble, it's everyone for themselves, buying thousands of rolls of toilet paper and every bottle of hand sanitizer they can get their hands on. I think when we look at the rampant selfishness and evil here in the world, I think we will agree that Paul's diagnosis that sin is built into our human nature rings true. We see this in Romans chapter 3, verses 10 to 12. As it is written, there is no one righteous, not even one. There is no one who understands, no one who seeks God. All have turned away and have together become worthless. How then can God declare those of us who are in Christ Jesus to be under no condemnation, given that we should all be condemned by our sin? Well, we can rule out anything that we can do. It can't come from within us. Nor can it come from us trying hard to be better, more socially adjusted people. There are no human programs, no university courses or self-help books that can help us. What then can be done? What we see is that only God can change our identity. Only God can make it so that we are now in Christ Jesus. Have a look back at Romans chapter 8 verse 2. Because through Christ Jesus, the law of the spirit of life set me free from the law of sin and death. Verse 2 is the reason why Paul can confidently say there is no condemnation for those of us in Christ Jesus. You see, a liberation has taken place through the Holy Spirit. And it's a liberation that could only take place through God's work. Paul put it succinctly in Romans chapter 8, verses 3 and 4. For what the law was powerless to do in that it was weakened by the sinful nature, God did by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful man to be a sin offering. And so he condemned sin in sinful man in order that the righteous requirements of the law might be met in us who do not live according to the sinful nature, but according to the spirit. One of the most dramatic hostage rescues in the last 50 years was pulled off by the Israeli special forces in 1976. An Air France airliner with a large number of Israeli citizens was hijacked mid-flight and then flown to Uganda, where Idi Amin's government was openly supportive of the terrorists. After a few days, the non-Israeli passengers were freed and flown to Paris. 
but 94 Israeli citizens were kept as hostages, trying to get the Israeli government to meet a list of humiliating demands. Operation Thunderbolt was the name of the operation to rescue the hostages. In the first phase of the operation, an Israeli military cargo plane landed late at night at the airport where the hostages were being kept. It unloaded several cars that looked like the motorcade that the Ugandan dictator usually drove around in, including a, back, a black Mercedes Benz. They were able to drive right up to the building where the hostages were being kept and rescue them. In the second phase, a much larger force of paratroopers landed to protect the freed hostages. While the aircraft refueled and then they all escaped in the plane. God's hostage rescue has two phases as well. In the first phase, God sends his own son into a world held prisoner to sin. God the Son is sent behind enemy lines to set us free from our imprisonment to the tyranny of sin. Notice that God doesn't just send a mere prophet to liberate his people, nor is a child in the manger some unlucky angel who drew the, straw, the short straw in heaven. The child is, as the Apostle John writes, God's one and only son. But Jesus, we know, was also fully man. But there's one important difference with Jesus. While he shares our humanity, he has skin and muscles. If you cut him as his Roman executioners did, he bled human blood. The big difference was that Jesus didn't share in our sinful nature. And this is crucial because only a sinless person can be in a position to die for the sins of another person. Otherwise, he would have had to die for his own sins like the rest of us. You see, Jesus knew no sin. And this is where the defeat of sin begins. Jesus, free of our sinful nature, was able to perfectly keep God's law. He was able to keep every single commandment. But more than that, he was able to take the penalty for our sin. Now, Romans 6 makes it very clear that the wages of sin is death. You see, sin still needs to be dealt with. God's justice needs to be satisfied. So God sends his one and only son as a sin offering. As a sin offering, Christ takes full responsibility for our sin so that we can be cleansed and forgiven. He takes God's anger upon himself. And if we are in Christ Jesus, as verse 1 says, then we are safe from God's anger. There is no condemnation for us from God because it's gone to Jesus. But that's not the end of God's plan to save humanity from our captivity to sin. We see that there is a second phase to God's, God's rescue operation. God not only set us free from the penalty of sin, but we see in verse 2 that through the work of the Holy Spirit, he also sets us free from sin's controlling power. The hostage rescue has been successful, not just in rescuing us from the penalty of sin, that's death, but we've also been liberated from the power sin has over us. Christ died so that we who live should no longer live for ourselves. Those of us who are in Christ Jesus are no longer under the condemnation that our sinful nature deserves. Instead, we are free at last to love what God loves and to hate what God hates. What the, the law couldn't do on its own because of our sinful nature, God did through sending his spirit so that we will love God. Now, this doesn't mean it won't be a fight to put our sinful natures to death. We still see the struggle between our sinful nature and our spirit nature in verses 5 to 11. But now this fight between our two natures will be a fair fight. I want you to think again about that hostage rescue scenario I mentioned a few minutes ago. Imagine that you were one of those hostages bound hand and foot by cable ties. Suddenly in the middle of the night, you hear an explosion at the door as the door blows in. Soldiers storm through the door, guns blazing, shooting the hostage takers. The commandos cut the cable ties and they throw you an M16 rifle. You're not free yet, are you? You can't become complacent because you are in the middle of a fight a fight which you are now a part of. You see, you are not freed f from the fight. You are freed for the fight. 
And this is how it is with us as Christians. We are freed for the fight. You see, who you are changes how you respond. We need to respond to this current crisis, not with our sinful nature, but with our spirit-filled nature. So what might this look like to respond to this crisis as a spirit-filled Christian? As a person who can confidently claim there is now no condemnation for those of us in Christ Jesus. Now we've seen people responding in all sorts of crazy and selfish ways to the threat of this virus. Hoarding toilet paper and flour and other canned goods. There are many ways our identity in Christ should impact how we respond to this crisis. But I'm going to pick three to focus on. Firstly, we should not be afraid. As Christians who have the confidence of Paul's declaration of no condemnation, we should not be afraid of the COVID-19 virus. Because no matter what happens, we have confidence and assurance. This doesn't mean you should go around licking the handrails at the hospital or doing something silly like that. We need to be smart. We need to obey the authorities. But we should not be afraid. Christians shouldn't be the ones hoarding toilet paper and canned goods. We need to trust God. God is still sovereign. Now you might be asking, if God is sovereign, why did he let this happen? That's a great question, which we're going to be spending some time on over the next few weeks thinking that through. Secondly, For those of us who don't need to fear God's condemnation, we have a message which this world, which has gone crazy from fear, needs to hear. I believe one of the big problems with evangelism in Western countries like Australia is that it's hard to tell people about how they can go to heaven when they think they already live there. Something like the COVID-19 virus shatters the illusion that we are in control of our world that we can bend nature to our will. And it's at times like this, your non-Christian friends are still looking for hope, looking for something which will save them. So offer them Jesus, who will save them from sin, a far greater enemy than the COVID-19 virus. It's also a great opportunity to invite your non-Christian friends to come to church. It's much easier and less scary for them to watch a video presentation in their Ugg boots and PJs at home than having to come into a church building. In fact, one of the reasons we're doing this series is that our non-Christian friends might hear what God has to say about this crisis. So can I encourage you to share these videos on your social media feed? The third way our identity as Christians changes how we respond to this crisis actually relates to the first two. When the world has gone crazy with people looking out for themselves, we have a great opportunity to love our neighbours. In fact, Christians have a long history of loving their neighbours in times like this. A historical sociologist named Rodney Stark wrote a book a while back where he explored how Christianity went from a small band of followers in an unimportant province of the, in the back of the Roman Empire to dominating the whole Roman Empire in around 300 years. He concluded that it was the behaviour of the Christians that was the game changer. You see, they were very different from everyone else in the Roman Empire, and that was attractive. One of the ways that the early Christians were good neighbours was that was the way they dealt with epidemics. You see, this whole COVID-19 thing is a shock to us. Because epidemics are pretty rare in our time, largely because of the vaccines that we have. We haven't really seen a real epidemic for 50 years, at least one in Australia. And we haven't seen one on the scale of what we're experiencing now for over 100 years. But epidemics were common in the ancient world. Rodney Stark points out that when an epidemic hit the horribly overcrowded cities of the Roman Empire, all of the wealthy people would get out of town to the countryside. They would, quarant- they would quarantine themselves away from the sickness. Whereas the Christians, they would stay in the city and look after the sick and the dying. Living life with that kind of love and hope and confidence was attractive in the ancient world. And I reckon it's still attractive today. Now, of course, we live in a modern society where we have great hospitals and doctors. So we probably don't need to worry so much about primary care of the sick. 
But there is still a lot we can do to love our neighbours and show the confidence that we have in Jesus at this time. Here are some of practical examples of how we can love our neighbours. Maybe write a note to all of your neighbours, particularly anyone who is more vulnerable to this virus. Or offer to do their shopping, to pick up their prescriptions. Or maybe even share a, a roll or two of toilet paper with them. Be kind to the people who are run off their feet in the shops. Wear your church t-shirt if you have one, so that people know that you're a Christian and you're behaving in a Christian way. What about looking after the kids of a nurse or a doctor or a Coles or Woolies worker so they can go to work and not worry about their kids? There are a lot of practical ways that we can demonstrate our confidence in Jesus at a time like this. Lots of ways we can react to this crisis according to our identity in Christ. Remember, who we are changes how we respond. If you're a Christian, then your identity is in Christ. And there is no condemnation for you. Let's respond to this crisis with that in mind. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you that you have changed our identity. That we don't need to fear condemnation, let alone this virus. We pray that you might help us to respond to this crisis out of our identity. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks for joining us this morning. We hope we see most of you at our Zoom morning tea at 11.15am. And thanks, Matt, for your message and the reminder that who we are in Christ changes how we respond and act towards others. We look forward to hearing from Matt again next week. The Apostle Paul, in writing to the Philippian church, helpfully explains in this blessing how our changed lives in Christ can be fruitful in his service. When we read Philippians chapter 1, verses 9 to 11, And this is my prayer, that your love may abound more and more in knowledge and depth of insight, so that you may be able to, to discern what is best and may be pure and blameless until the day of Christ, filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ, to the glory and praise of God. Amen. See you next week.